Okay. Welcome to another hour or so with inspiring writers in this truly extraordinary benefit series, Piesas de Resistance, celebrating Alaska Quarterly Review's 40th anniversary. Features readings and conversations with new and emerging writers, as well as established authors and poets who, like today's guests, have all been published in AQR. You can find recordings of previous programs at our website at aqreview.org and our YouTube channel. Today we have three wonderful writers and we are so fortunate to get to share the next hour hearing their wise and tender words. I'm Heather Lendy and on behalf of the Center for Narrative Arts and Narrative and Lyric Arts, welcome. Uh, we're hosted by the Anchorage Museum at Rasmussen Center and thank you to Adam Tate for producing today's show and thank you to our guest writers and also thanks to you for being here. Gunas as we say in Haines, Alaska, where I am on this uh, slushy wet day on the banks of the Chilkat River in the homeland of the Clinket, Jilkat Gwan and Jilkut Gwan. While this reading is free, AQR, like all literary journals these days, could use your help. So please consider a donation. And thank you very much to those of you that have already uh, donated as we're um, really well on our way to our modest goal of $15,000. Now I'd like to introduce Ronald Spatz, the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Alaska Quarterly Review. Ron is a professor of English at the University of Alaska and a former National Endowment for the Arts Fellow and the recipient of two Alaska Governor's Awards and a Contribution to Literacy Award from the Alaska Center for the Book. Under Ron's four decades plus of leadership and vision, the Alaska Quarterly Review has created strong connections between our state and the larger literary community in the US and abroad. And AQR has been influential in supporting new and emerging writers and also presenting works that include a rigorous questioning of larger societal issues. Ron. Thank you, Heather, and welcome everyone. Um, this event is being recorded and will be available on the Alaska Quarterly Review YouTube channel and all past events are archived there as well. So take a look if you've missed any of these uh, events in our series. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few important acknowledgements. Alaska Quarterly Review gratefully acknowledges the Anchorage Museum uh, for hosting and providing technical support for this event and Web 907 for its web support. The Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arch, Alaska Quarterly Review's 501c3 umbrella organization, all of whom make this event possible. I also want to make a land acknowledgement Alaska Quarterly Review recognizes the indigenous land on which all Alaskans live. AQR is located in Anchorage and Anchorage is the Nina homeland. The Nina is the language spoken by the traditional present and future caretakers of this land. Land acknowledgement opens a space with gratefulness and respect for the contributions, innovations and contemporary perspective of indigenous peoples and marks our collective movement towards decolonization and equity. As Heather said, um, we have two outstanding poets uh, reading today, Maxine Skates and Chris Martin, and AQR's contributing editor, Bonnie Nadzim, an award-winning novelist, short story writer, and essayist. Joining me today as co-moderator, uh, you've met Heather Lendy. Heather is the author of four books, all published by Algonquin. If you lived here, I'd know your name. Take good care of the garden and the dogs. Find the Good, which is this year's Alaska Reads book, and her recently published Up Bears and Ballads. And now I send it back over to Heather Lindy. Thank you, Ron. I'm uh, gonna go ahead and, and introduce everybody at, at once and then um, and then we'll, we'll all get to hear them after that. Um, uh, Chris Martin is the author of multiple poetry books. His full-length poetry collections include The Falling Down Dance, 
Becoming Weather, both from Coffee House and American Music, published by Copper Canyon, which was selected by C.D. Wright for the Hayden Carruth Award. He's also the author of several poetry chapbooks, including History, Enough, and How to Write a Mistakest Poem. His poems have been performed by dancers, musicians, filmmakers, and guerrilla readers in the Minneapolis Skyways. In 2009, the Poetry Society of America recognized him as one of their biennial New American Poets. He's also served as a writer in residence at the Minnesota History Center and as a Bartos Fellow at the United World College. In 2015, Chris co-founded Unrestricted Interest, a consultancy and writing program that's dedicated to transforming the lives of kids and adults on the autism spectrum through poetry and song. He also co-edits Unrestricted Editions dedicated to transforming poetry and song through the voices of those with autism. Chris Martin, who says, Perhaps it's time to reimagine how we view and serve the autism community. A social deficit, like attending equally to all facets of the environment, can be restaged as an ethical strength, enlarging what we care for and about. We often demand that people with autism learn how to act more like us, he says, some specious version of normal, but what if, what if we spent more time trying to understand how each individual voice, precisely because it is different, might contribute to a larger and more invigorating conversation about who we are and how we're changing to meet an increasingly complex and diverse world. Maxine Skates was born in Los Angeles and grew up in a working class neighborhood. She worked her way through college, graduating from California State University at Northridge, where she was encouraged by the poet Anne Stanford. After graduation, she moved to Eugene, Oregon, where she earned an MFA from the University of Oregon. Her fourth collection of poetry, My Wilderness, is forthcoming from the University of Pittsburgh Press this fall. She's the author of three previous collections of poetry, Undone, which was a finalist for the Green Rose Prize, and about which another AQR series featured poet, Dorian Locks, observed, by brave and honest recognition, coupled with a deft ability to glide between realms of perception tripped open by memory and emotion, Maxine Skates reconstructs a life undone by the brokenness of family, friends, and self. Nuanced, mysterious, intimate, Beautiful poems. Black Loam received the Lyre Prize and was a finalist for the Oregon Book Award and Toluca Street won the Agnes Lynch Star at Poetry Prize and the Oregon Book Award for Poetry. Maxine is also the co-editor with David Trinidad of Holding Our Own, the selected poems of Anne Stanford. Her poems have been widely published from the New Yorker, AQR, the American Poetry Review, to Poetry Magazine, the New England Review, Plowshares, Plume, Prairie Schooner, and the Virginia Quarterly Review. And she has received, among other awards, the Vern Rostella Award from Hubbub and two Pushcart Prizes. She has received fellowships from the McDowell Colony, Caldera, Literary Arts, and the Oregon Arts Commission. A former poetry editor of Northwest Review, she taught poetry at Lane Community College, Lewis and Clark College, and Reed. Currently, she teaches privately. Bonnie Nadzim is an Alaska Quarterly Review contributing editor. Her first novel, Lamb, was recipient of the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize, was long listed for the Bailey Women's Prize for Fiction in the UK, and was translated into several languages. Of Lamb, Amy Bender wrote, Nadzim's prose is just gorgeous. She writes about people and skies and mountains and landscapes with incredible precision and appreciation of beauty. A reader can swim in these sentences and soak up the landscape via the prose with great pleasure. The book was also made into an award-winning independent film of the same name, Lamb. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in English Literature and Environmental Studies from Carleton College, a Master of Fine Arts from the Arizona State University, and an MA and a PhD from the University of Southern California. 
She's also a member of the Center for Fiction Writers Council, Zen Peacemakers International, and a board member of the Great Plains Zen Center. Bonnie Nadzim, who writes, I've had some writing teachers who did me a tremendous service in their unexpected emphasis on neither telling stories nor teaching nor becoming. The more I can identify the stories I'm telling myself and others, the more easily I can dispense of them. You really do know less and less the deeper you go, a teacher told her. And for that, and for and said that for her, that practice has made all of the difference. So we're really lucky today. Um, without further ado, we'll begin with uh, Chris. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, thank you to everyone here tonight. Um, it's a real pleasure to get to read with Maxine and Bonnie, who I've known for a very long time. Um, and uh, who I'm in the same state uh, with right now, but pretty far away. Um, you may occasionally hear some sounds from behind me because there are small children who run around this house at this time. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm really excited. I you know, was so grateful to have an early essay from, uh, this forthcoming book of uh, essays published in AQR. Um, and I, tonight, I'm going to read um, a small section from the introduction uh, to give you kind of a greater um, kind of foundation for what this book is and is trying to do. Um, and although, Yes, I am a poet. Um, I won't be reading my own poems, but there will be plenty of poems and ideas about poems in this introduction. We all seek patterns, but neurodivergent individuals tend to seek them out with a combination of knack and urgency that is startling and not coincidental. In 2014, Camilla and Henry Markram posited the intense world theory, which explores the way autistic neurology is characterized by ways of processing the world that are both uniquely dynamic and uniquely complex. They posited that autistic minds aren't under-resourced, as was often considered to be the case, but over-connected. They noted that the fabric of autistic brain circuitry is much more dense and ornate than in the general population. This is one key to understanding why many young children seem to regress into autism around two or three years old, just at the time when most young brains are beginning to prune neurons away for a more streamlined set of connections. The abundance of connectivity often leads to synesthetic experiences of the world, hearing colors or tasting sounds, but it can also create a sort of cognitive and perceptual feedback the bandwidth too wide to be processed amid the chaos of neurotypical life. If, as intense world theory argues, we think of the autistic brain as being like a supercomputer, we can begin to understand how crucial context, how crucial context and environment are to the success of that processing potential. Denizens of the intense world desire a means to tune out sensory feedback and tune in the deep focus of perception turning intensity from foe to friend. Though it's clear that this vocabulary of processing can be useful, I also wanna push back a little on the neuroreductive objectification this supercomputer metaphor can engender. For it threatens once again to obscure the essential humanness of autistic experience. When I'm with my students, I'm not thinking of them as anything but the lovely humans that I see before me. We relate to each other as friends, trusting that we're each there to listen and learn, to extend kindnesses and generosities that befit our ever evolving fellowship. So while neurological frameworks may be helpful in conceptualizing autistic cognition, teaching is something entirely different. It's two humans sitting with each other, looking to connect, watching for meaning in movement listening for moments in language that resonate and exhilarate. 
One of my students, Sid Ghosh, a non-speaking autist with Down syndrome, offers us a more natural metaphor for autistic intensity. And I'll read Sid's poem, Volcanic Mind. Humming friends, torque screw language into my mining mind. Mind secretes modes of intense lava. Lava makes own path. Fire forges mind. To think mind is hot is to hammer bones with air. For Sid, Forging mind is an intense and ongoing process, one that can be helped along by humming friends who torque screw language. Tuning in allows Sid to secrete the raw material of thought, which then seeks its own paths. Sid hears birds and they prompt the forge of his mind. He hears humming words hammering on his ear bones with air as friends ask a question or read his last line aloud. And this humming stokes his internal heat, allowing him to forge his own way with language, accessing the abundant treasure that exists there. Even then, however, this treasure may need a mold to pour itself into, a form that can hold its immense value and shape. This is where poetry comes in. I believe the sensuous patterns and dynamic formal possibilities of poetry are uniquely designed to help autists translate aspects of their intense multidimensional thought into linguistic expression. Poems carry the dynamism embodied in movement, mining, forging, hammering. Poems and patterns help organize the innate movement of the body into thought initiating a complex dance that one of my students, Aman Bukela, calls motioning truth. And again, I think it's important to note that this process of motioning truth isn't unique to autists. Through routine, habit, predilection, we all summon the patterns that help us grasp our own truths and meet the challenge of any moment. But those challenges, especially for many, of my autistic students feature a bracing combination of sensory intensity and motor perplexity that can set the world swirling. No wonder then that they move so often toward the anchor pattern provides. In his poem, I Use Patterns to Survive, non-speaking autist Chaitan Januru advises the reader, feel it and follow it. He continues, my life follows a pattern of many other autistics, so I learn from them. Our lives are products of invincible codes that create invincible patterns. I write and update them. I design and fuel them into real life circumstances and add simplicity to educate myself. To feel and follow the pattern is to educate yourself. So many of the autists I know are autodidacts and like so much that we do in life for ourselves, by ourselves, outside of any school or tuition. This kind of self-education is largely an act of intuition. We move deep inside our antenna body, feeling our way through the flesh and texture of an abundant world toward the focus of frequency, seeking above all else a sense of attunement. Instead of memorizing facts to prepare for some uncertain future life, we become autodidacts of the now, a manifold of objects and creatures and perceptions that call us into perception. This is the dance Adam writes about so vibrantly. I mentioned Adam earlier in the introduction. A flow made possible by our abiding relation to a nearly impossible world so bursting it is with sensory detail. Patterns help us tune in to the inherent sim simplicity we seek, a wayfaring line amid the spectacular chaos of contemporary life. They move us from the babbling patter of life, as Adam would say, to the pattern of it, tuning in to meaningful ways of moving and languaging. Though these patterns arise differently for each person, there are overlaps, a confluence of ways in which we begin to find commonality. Poems can be a meeting ground where we share our complementary experiences of the world. Poems and patterns can ground us and the commons 
of our overlapping ground can be a place where we grow consensual neurodiverse futures. Or to borrow a neologism from Hannah Emerson, another student of mine, poems are where we can ground ourselves. And ground here is spelled G-R-O-W-N-D. So you have both grow and ground coming together. This word is born from her observation that to authentically reach, one must also authentically root. In her writing, as you'll see, Hannah creates a pattern of roots and reaches to hold her phrases, which often begin with an anaphoric please and end with the doubled yes of her joyful epistrophe. This is a poem by Hannah Emerson called Hannah is Never Only Hannah. Please get that I am the trying breeze going through the really great, great, great world. Yes, yes. Please get that I am the drowning, helpful freedom of the storm. Yes, yes. Please get that I am the very hot, great, great, great sun. Yes, yes. Please get that I am the great, 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 great ice that gives you the freeze you need to get to melt into nothing. Yes, 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 yes. Please get that I am the sky. Great, great, great blue nothing. Yes, yes. Please get that I am the ground. Great, great, great place helping you helping you stand in grateful, helpful, 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 kissing her, 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 yes. Please get that you and I greet the great, great life from this place of great, great kissing life, 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 yes, yes, yes. Please get that you are great form, great formless, helping, kissing, kissing, great, knowing the great, 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 helpful, kissing the trying, yes, yes. Please get that helpful, loving, thinking you help, just help, kissing, helpful, loving, great, great, great world turn upside down, yes, yes. Please get that you help me by helping me turn upside down too. Yes, yes, yes. Please get that great, great, helpful kissing people need to get that great, helpful kissing is turning kissing upside down. Yes, yes. Please get that helpful kissing just needs to be gathered into this helpful kissing trying hell of this life to go forward to help me, Hannah, 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 yes, yes. Please get that you need loving kissing to make you like me, yes, yes. Please get that the kissing must be great nodding of you, me, great, us, together in this hell, yes, yes, yes. Please get that you kiss me, helping me kiss you, yes, yes. Whew. This wasn't the first time Hannah had used the neologism ground, and so I was prepared when she spelled it that way. I had also encountered her repetitions of great and yes, as well as her use of the anaphoric please. These patterns had accrued in her work poem by poem. Our previous sessions and all the conversations about pattern and language they entailed formed the ground for my listening. These exchanges are true to Hannah's vision, asking and affirming, assuring the reader a consensual space where our ways can cross and not and kiss. You may occasionally feel turned upside down when encountering these poems thrown into a momentary disequilibrium. Motioned truth can throttle even the most seasoned reader, but hell is sometimes where we must begin. There is great solace in beginning there together, a multiplication of greats that help ground us in the simple grace of being gathered, 
of the possibility of belonging to each other. And the reciprocity intrinsic to that project of belonging, you kiss me, helping me kiss you, is what draws us into the multi-directional flow of expression. For a time, Hannah began each phrase with the word keep. She was insistent that we must keep each other in the flow and in the light. It was in this context that she revealed the term she uses for poets, keepers of the light, those committed to cultivate and keep the illuminations we need. In this phrase, I hear the echoes of poet activist Audre Lorde, who wrote, poetry is not a luxury. It is a vital necessity of our existence. It forms the quality of light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams toward survival and change. In and against the consistent imposition of fear and silence, we must seek the illuminative means to see and sing. And it mattered to Lord that we seek it together, even or especially across difference without ever minimizing or alighting those differences. Hannah and I couldn't agree more, believing that these lights are nothing if not shared, that the light only exists, in fact, when it leaps forth in the space between us and becomes a bridge we keep together. Or, as Lord wrote, poetry is not only dream and vision, it is the skeleton architecture of our lives. It lays the foundation for a future of change, a bridge across our fears of what has never been before. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Chris. I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading that book. I'm, I'm, uh, I imagine we all are now. Um, Maxine? I certainly am. That was just, thank you, Chris, for reading that. And uh, it was a very, very powerful introduction to the book and I'm I'll definitely seek it out. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here to read with Chris and, and Bonnie, to meet Ron after a very long time of submitting and, and being published by AQR for which I am extremely grateful. Um, I'm hoping that everybody will remember that this is a benefit series and will continue to support in AQR and help them reach their goal. And I'm gonna begin with uh, several poems from My Wilderness and end with a newer poem. Uh, this is the title poem. I tried to grow what others grew, eggplants and zinnias, tomatoes, dahlias, even corn. But there were too many trees, the darkness beneath them growing mushrooms, fawn lilies and trillium as the years I longed for sun passed and I learned to love the trees. This winter, the day the ice storm came, branches cracked and fell all morning, taking others with them. And in the afternoon, a maple and a cherry fell across the roof. At dusk, when it was over, the owls, two and three and maybe four, more than I'd ever heard, echoed the day's losses. But because I live among the trees, my worst dream is of the bulldozers, which will come someday after this hillside has been logged. They'll come the way they did to the old cherry orchard, where every spring someone raked the earth around the still leafless trees, the tine lines visible from the road. And then one day I'd round the corner and come upon them, their endless clouds of blossom. It takes so much work to turn an orchard into a bare field, ready for a subdivision, trunks split, stumps chained, wrenched and dragged away, all of it worse than any storm. Because branches gathered for kindling, trees cut and chopped, Spring does recover what a month ago seemed broken, the big leaf maples filling in the gaps. If I have to leave here, I'll never leave in spring. I won't leave the wisteria dangling outside my window, the globes of rhododendrons out under the firs suspended like red lanterns in the rain. It takes a long time to learn how to live anywhere. 
The irises last a season or two, then dwindle. The daylilies lasted 20 years before their roots gave way to rot. But the wisteria, the rhododendrons, the maples, firs, and wild cherries recede themselves. Even the difficult oak keeps growing. And the roses, if I could say what a life is, I'd say roses, how they taught me early of desire in the way a man bent laying pipe on a Sunday to make a rose garden for his wife because he couldn't love her any other way. And when the marriage fell to ruin, it was the roses that survived each bud unfurling through dog and drought. I'd tell how I planted the Abraham Lincoln for my mother because it was her favorite, though as it turned out, I planted it too close to the path. And so she brushed against it every morning as it stood wet with dew. And when she fell and had to leave her home forever, I cut her deep red roses and brought them to her in her hospital bed and then she did not cry. But those were hybrids, vulnerable to, vu to bug and mildew. My roses are old roses. They love the shade. They sprawl over trellises that barely bear their weight. They twine among the trees, blossoming in clusters, tiny and uncuttable, bright beacons in the twilight world under a sky I cannot see for green. They smell of musk, and when I try to train them, they won't mind. Fierce with thorns, they snag my arms, draw blood. And yet I scrape the moss off the flat blue stones that lead to them, as if I were scrubbing the steps of a church or shrine, so I could stand beneath them when they bloom. If I leave here, it will be because I cannot tend what I barely tend now. If I leave, I'll leave in autumn, the rose canes dead, leaves turning yellow. I'll leave the way my mother did, never looking back. So this poem, um, Eternity or Infinity, I believe is in the current issue of uh, AQR. And uh, I owe a debt to Ron and the poetry staff for asking me to take off the last line of the poem. I think Ron said, do you, would, you, would you entertain this? I, and I miss this in editing over a long year time of publishing poems in journals. Nobody does it anymore. Um, and I really appreciated it. So here's, here's eternity or, or, or infinity. It's a question mark. <clears throat> I've thought them interchangeable. They even sound alike. But today tells me one has more light and is like looking out at the sea and finding I have to look away because the blue, the froth of the waves, the white variations of tidal sands and whiter birds gathered to search for tiny shrimp and worms in the outgoing tide are too bright to look at. And though the sea seems infinite, this view with people and dogs strolling Everyone remarkably cordial, even the dogs, could be the eternity any, anyone would be happy to have here on a late February day on the Oregon coast where the temperature will reach 60 degrees when Boston is still under three feet of snow after weeks of endless storms. I know infinity isn't this bright, I think it has an ominous sense of the undertow, less what we imagine than something so big we can't. I don't think my mother thought about infinity each morning when she set off for the bus stop on her way to work. She thought about how time lived in the number of steps to the bus stop and how many minutes it took to walk them. And doesn't infinity have to do with the time we don't have, never had, with why it will be 60 degrees here today when it's still snowing in Boston, keeping kids home from school and parents from going to work and eventually not paying their bills. My mother lived that way too, paycheck to paycheck, yet she knew someday eternity would be her, 
her reward. And it occurs to me that if you believe in eternity, maybe infinity doesn't matter, even as it threatens to spin us back into where we came from, from which from which does which does make eternity a lot more appealing in infinity what we'd like to forget. Because isn't it true that mostly all we want to do is make a story about how we got here and why we're good enough to stay? This is a poem uh, about a long marriage called The Orchards. There were problems to be solved then, decisions to be made. Now we walk and walk through the orchards, the cannery orchard, the nursery orchard, the black cherry orchard. We walk to the river, the far boundary, high and wide, deep and brown, a ganglia of branches tumbling, shooting down the rapids, then caught by the branch of a down tree. There's a man sitting on a bench, aiming a long lens an old couple walking who stopped to pet our young dog. The nursery orchard makes me think of how the decisions quieted, moved on. How long ago I'd take those tests in secret and never the right color, I thought it was him. Later, I found out it was both of us. And oddly, that made it better, our decision made. The young trees in this orchard were grown for transplant, or maybe they just took cuttings because now they're as gnarled as the tree in the meadow they call the wedding tree, the which was split in a storm. It's fallen branches still scattered around the still living base. It's the goat orchard I keep wondering about though. Did the goats run there the way the dogs do now in their endless loops? Last night, I saw a photo of goats standing in the branches of a tree they climbed to eat its nuts. At first, they looked much too heavy to ride the branches, 10 of them standing in the same tree. And then they looked as light as horned birds. So yes, the decisions lessen, but the problems remain. The one about the heart, the way it rises, the one about finding your way to it, as if walking in a maze of so many orchards, each one needs a name. I'm carefully looking at the time here. Um, this book is, this poem is called Return. And many of the poems in, the, are, in this book are about my mother who lived to the age of 100 years and eight days. Return. I was reading about faith. The author said we return to what we believed in when we were young, but I can say with certainty, I did not believe in a God. Maybe gods though. The ones I found in the Edith Hamilton mythology my mother gave me when I was a kid. As for return, the word says something about time I don't understand, unless it's the way I stood at the kitchen sink washing dishes and staring at my mother's collection of birds and one brass giraffe she bought at the zoo. I wondered if I put away all the things she wanted me to remember her by, would I keep remembering? Then I recalled that after she retired, she loved going to the zoo. And how one day when I went with her, we sat on a bench and she reached into her straw bag and gave me a sandwich and an apple. When I was a kid, there was never enough time for just sitting on a bench eucalyptus rustling overhead, eating our lunch. She was too busy just getting by. But on that bench, it seemed we could return to what we never had and have it, as we did one day in the hospital last winter while we waited hours for a doctor to come and talk about hospice. Then nothing hurried, 
And as if we were on that bench again, my mother growing weightless, tiny as her time was ending, told me how for a quarter she'd flown high above Long Beach in a two seat plane 80 years before. And how one day she'd gone to a mortuary with a friend who worked there because she wanted to see a body and did and found she was not afraid of what she saw. And though I've often thought she told the same stories over and over, I'd never heard either of these. We talked on and on, and when I thought to thank her for the mythology, she asked why I liked Greeks. And by now, I know it's because they never die, but live unknown among us. She was quiet then, so I asked if there was anything she wanted to know about what was coming, and she said, yes, when will I die? She knew I couldn't answer, but I told her again there were ways of making dying easier, ways to prepare. And when the doctor did come, she listened and signed the papers, though in the end, I don't know that it was easier, just a kind of map to follow what can't be followed, until, as I imagined it, she stepped off a cliff, the way we do in dream, but this time kept on falling. And I'll end with a, a poem called Ways of Seeing with a nod to John Berger, but uh, this is the end of, we're approaching the first year of the pandemic. Ways of Seeing. Yesterday, my neighbor wearing his mask was taunted by two younger men in the grocery store who said, it's only a virus old man, which surprised him as it does me. And since I'm of an age that means I should be careful for now and my short forever, I wonder what it is those men didn't want to understand. My mask is blue with swirls on it and reversible. Online, I saw a mask with penises. The woman who wore it said, if you were close enough to see the penises, you were too close. Whereas if you are trying to ignore the virus, maybe you think like your own fear, it will go away with summer or ultraviolet light, even as the rest of us still hope for only a few years more before, as the signs posted randomly around the neighborhood say, this too will pass. And life as we knew it will resume because the scientists have found a vaccine. And then, if there is a then, will we remember the tens of thousands who have died or what we have learned about being ready if it comes again? Or will life know it as we knew it mean that the owners of meat packing plants will still insist workers work so close to each other that they knock elbows and that the drug companies will make their millions, which others will share too, if they've gotten a good tip from say their senator and bought the right stock before the big discovery happens. And if it doesn't, will we inject ourselves with bleach or any other household disinfectant we've been inhaling for years? Poisons like fear itself being so much more familiar, consoling even, than the possibilities of science we grow impatient with when the fix is not as quick or as simple as we'd like. The other day, I found a 30-year-old letter from my mother-in-law addressed to us in Italy. And with the gift of the address, we used Google Earth to find the street in Florence where we had lived. For a moment, we walked down Via San Nicolo and crossed the Ponte Vecchio into the city. And then I remembered that somewhere in the hills behind us was Galileo's house. He lived there in his later years under house arrest, sentenced by the Inquisition because he believed the earth was not the center of the universe. And so we stood again reading the brass plaque on one of the walls surrounding the house, thinking of how in his confinement, Galileo might have stood looking through the telescope he had invented, its powers allowing him to see the craters of the unsmiling moon, the moons of Jupiter and the shared infinite fields of the Milky Way.
Oh, thank you, Maxine. Oh, don't you want to go to Florence again <laughs> sometime? Um, and Bonnie, from a, a very unique um, uh, office today. Yes. Um, this is my uh, pandemic Zoom office, and the sun is down in Minnesota, so I'm in the dark. <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, it was the best guarantee that all of us would have um, uninterrupted quiet for reading. Um, and I want to echo the thanks to the Anchorage Museum and um, to all of you in Alaska um, who are like Hannah, uh, Keepers of the Light, to Ron Spatz for your four decades of days and nights seeking out beauty and trying to communicate it to the world. Um, even now, even in the midst of all this, thank you. It's important and appreciated. And it's a joy to read with Chris and with Maxine. Um, I'm gonna read uh, one very short story. Uh, I seem to, <laughs> in recent days, have, um, I keep writing how-to stories. I think it's because I'm trying to figure out how to live and it's very confusing because every day is different. <laughs> um, so this one is called, um, How to Take Back Your Life If You've Been Selling Your Labor. You're on foot on your way to the subway to work when between two storefronts of steel and frosted glass, you see an unmarked wooden door. You're sure it's never been there before. In the door is a little golden key. You slow your steps, glancing around, while the march of financiers continues at full speed around you, their beautiful dark coats flapping behind them like wings. You're running a few minutes behind yourself and have a full day already stacked up at your desk. You don't know how much longer you can survive this job, but regular decent pay is such a necessary, if not blessed thing. The offer had seemed like so much when you accepted the position. Now somehow the lesson that had once seemed like great, that what had once seemed like great bounty turns out to be a trap you can't afford to escape. It burns you. Whether it is the heat of anger or heat of shame, you couldn't say. On this morning, however, you step aside out of the rush of innovators and entrepreneurs, every one of them vying for the near mythic prominence that comes from a perfect union of ownership and management, audacity and competitive cunning, dominance and wealth. You touch the door with your fingertips. The wood is old, as smooth as polished stone. You always knew you'd come across an unmarked door like this. You'd read about them in stories of a certain kind. Of course, you know enough about this kind of tale to appreciate that magic is unpredictable. Sometimes it is nothing more than a mean trick. You stand there looking at the door. The door looks back at you. Your children are at home with your husband who will be dropping them off at school shortly. You made them strawberry toast this morning with hot milk. Their kisses goodbye were sweet. You rubbed a spot of jam off one of their chins and can still feel the stickiness on your thumb and the warmth on the back of your neck where your husband put his fingers as he whispered in your ear. Then you both smiled and he handed you your own beautiful dark coat. You're trying, the two of you. You do have so much. You are never hungry and you are never bored. You are never without. Every need that could possibly arise has its solution within three or four city blocks. And these three or four city blocks repeat themselves in every direction forever. There's no place that isn't city that isn't addressing your immediate needs. At little cost and with little effort, you can basically have what you want, when, where, and how you want it. So how is it that year 10 in the same enviable, white frosted, spacious, sun-drenched apartment, you have such a sharp sense of home slipping away. And why does this provoke such an unbearable yearning in you? Why this peculiar feeling that you must, yet cannot, tear yourself away from it all? 
Why does the city feel like a dark playground, an elaborate lure designed by some force determined to entrap you? You once saw a movie about a woman who was driven so mad by her workaday life that when a colleague suggested her turnaround time on some particular task might be a little too slow, she snapped. She turned over her desk, not all at once, of course, because the desk was heavy, but painfully and slowly in several movements, grunting as everyone watched her in silence. Then she left her car in the parking tower and walked home, where she threw all of her lovely belongings out the window of her apartment on the 23rd floor. As you watched the film, you envied the woman snapping. How could you also authentically snap? You were interested. You wanted to know if you had it in you. In the movie, the camera stayed nearly a full minute on the woman's many colored wilted shirts floating down to the street and slowly settling only just now before this door. Last spring, your mother died. You sat alone with her in a dimly lit room holding her hand as she shuddered through her last breaths. Birds were singing outside the shaded window. She was 73. You're running out of time. The air on the other side of the door is clean and bracing. Though it had been early morning in the city, it's already midday here and the sun is high overhead. You understand just as you might within a dream that this is because time moves even faster over here. You stand on a slight rise. Beneath your feet is a thick mat of grass whirled and combed into peaks like the hide of a wild animal and you slip off your shoes. All around you, sunlight pours like gold over a green, green world. No time to stop and stare. The shadows are stretching and shifting quickly. Your eye has caught a figure ahead of you among the shapes of trees, a woman carrying a lamp. She has always been there up ahead, hasn't she? She was outside the bedroom window this morning, far below on the street, wasn't she? Ahead of you, her figure steps into shadow and is gone. You have to follow her. You know it as you know the weight of your own face. She is what you came here for. There's a dense forest in the distance. For now you're on a narrow path that winds around beneath the hardwood trees through a cathedral of leaves and branches alive with eyes and claws, tails and wings. In the distance, a man stands half in sun, half in shade, swinging an ax with both hands in swift and steady arcs over his head. When the metal blade rings against the wood, your head sings and your heart knocks hard in your chest. I knew it, you think. I knew it. A, children of, a circle of children in bright clothing, tossing a golden ball. An old woman at a well, her hair tied up around a polished bone, her sinewy arms hauling in a full leather bucket. An even older man up to his elbows in black earth, scooping up potatoes, smooth as eggs, into a little sack beside him. Beneath a knotted apple tree, a fermented perfume of fruit mashed beneath your feet brings you back, back, further back in time, even as the sun reaches its zenith and begins coming down again across the other side of the sky, late afternoon already. How can the day be so short? How can there be so little time? The trees and grass grow shaggier, the cultivated fields are slowly overcome with wildflowers and hat high grass. The birds of prey swinging against the blue sky grow larger and larger. Wooden cottages in the distance flatten and morph into crude huts of stone and mud. Back in the city, your children will be expecting you. You can see the white ovals of their faces hanging inside the school window, watching. Their teachers will use the emergency contact numbers, first your husband, then your neighbor. So you walk on instinctively toward the line of trees that marks the beginning of the forest. You enter the trees at twilight and the hair goes up on the back of your neck. There has never been anyone to ask for directions or instructions, and there isn't now. The green black leaves whisper and breathe around and above you. Beneath your bare feet, the earth, its needles and fine twigs and dissolving lace of dead leaves has the thickness and spring you imagine of a giant animal tongue. The creatures seem to recognize you, a fox blinking in its den, a skeletal insect with its long legs folded neatly behind it, 
The veins of mineral glitter in a giant stone, a shrike that pauses on a branch, tips its head and looks you in the eye. Everyone in there is in on something except for you. And they all know you don't know it. You feel a fool. You want to protest. I am from a city not of my own making, you tell them all. In this city, no one else is in on it anymore either. Who would have told me? How could I have known? They shake their heads and tisk. They line up and look at you. Every day you live in that city, you are making it, they say. How many doors have been presented to you? And only now, when you are desperate and almost out of time, have you passed through one? Is that purity of heart? Was I supposed to be pure of heart, you ask? Yes, they say, you were supposed to be pure of heart. And am I really out of time? Pretty much. How long do I have? Until dawn. And then what? And then what, they all say together and repeat it again and again. And then what, and then what, and then what? Until it becomes the mocking call of a shrieking bird and they all disappear, taking their places in the dark. Evening falls completely over and around you. The woods are damp and cool. Mushrooms rise up and open like tiny umbrellas around your ankles. The pale yellow petals of little forest flowers close up like hands in prayer. The stars are taking their positions and the moon washes the leaves and vines of the forest floor in runny milky light. Something screeches from deep within the woods and you feel them before you hear them. Hooves, horses, pulling the dome of night overhead, dragging another morning in behind them. You walk briskly and the air is so crisp that your hair whistles in the wind. You see a glimmer in the trees ahead, the lamp, the lady. The moon is arching overhead fast. You can tell by the way the shadows of the heart-shaped leaves are spinning. There in a little clearing before you is something half cave, half home, and a space cut out among the trees that is exactly the shape of your apartment in the city. The figure with the lamp has gone inside. There is only one makeshift window now shattered with a circle of wood pocked with holes through which you can see. Inside, cobwebs tent the corners where the ceiling meets the walls. The whole place is of sticks, stone, and mud. The woman inside is now greeting her children. One of them holds up a necklace of seeds. The other points to the fire where game birds are turning over the coals. A man steps before the, before the fire and takes the woman up in his arms, frightening her, and they all laugh. When he speaks, the man's voice hums in your sternum the way the ax hit the wood in the early afternoon. They are all a little elongated like shadows, black shadows. The woman takes a bundle of cloth the size of a fist out of her dress and opens it on a little table by the fire. They all bend over it. The man puts his hand on the woman's back. Together the children say, ooh. They all stand up a little straighter in its presence. You yourself briefly feel a sense of ease and well-being. You feel momentarily erased. Oh, you think, that's what it's like. Then the feeling is gone. Everyone in there is beaming. You begin banging on the shutter with your fists. Nobody looks your way. I used to have that too, you yell. You back up and turn around, hollering up into the trees, standing at their posts. The last words ring around you in an echo. Then it is so quiet you can hear yourself drawing every breath. As the night grows blacker around you, the inside of the little hovel grows brighter. You can see the woman clearly now. She's hairy, almost from head to toe. She has a snaggle tooth and a pot belly. She has your eyes. Her naked hairy breasts shake as she laughs and sway as she crosses the room, her nipples pointing down at the dirt floor. She shuffles her feet the way your grandmother used to and touches the heads of her children the way your mother used to. Let me in, you say quietly now, for there's clearly no point in raising your voice. You don't know how to speak to this woman in a way that she will hear. Please let me in. 
The horse hooves are close behind you now. You can smell the musk of the animals approaching and you feel it like a knife's blade across your heart when the sun cracks the Eastern horizon with a long searing line of white, dawn. You reach out to push your way through the crude door but the lights have gone out. The family of shadows is gone and all you touch as your hand hangs in the darkness is wiry, damp, coarse hair. Time passes swiftly, your mother told you, from the narrow hospital bed set up in her apartment. Her eyes were large. The sockets of her eyes were large. Her hand a spotted claw in your own smooth hand. What time is it now, she asked. She was always asking. Almost 11, you say. The window beside her bed was black. Almost 11, she said. And what time is it now? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Bonnie and uh, Maxine and Chris. And it's, it's about four o'clock. I know that two of you have busy children <laughs> waiting for you, but I, I, I want to give you an opportunity, even uh, among yourselves, I guess I'm interested to hear if any of you have questions for each other or something else that you'd like to add. I just, I wondered um, if you two, if, well, anybody, I, I have the sense that time has changed in the last year. And, and, and Bonnie's story was so much about time and, and, uh, and Chris is, is thinking about t time and perception. And I, I wondered if you, if you have the sense of time changing in the way we, we, we use it and interact with it and think about it, is it a permanent change? I think something in our DNA has changed basically, but I'll just throw that out. <laughs> You know, I keep, that's such a good question. I keep having this sense um, off and on, sort of like, like uh, switching the light off and on during the day that came at me really powerfully when Chris was reading the poems by the people he works with. And it's the sense that everything is happening simultaneously. Yeah. And yeah. That, um, that there's a way to communicate back and forth from a certain groundedness with a W <laughs> and um, it's hard it's been hard for me to find that groundedness with the W in such a small space with so many hats on and so many roles to play um, but I'm inspired by everything both of you have read tonight to go back to that as many times a day as I can. Yeah, a student that I mentioned but did not read a poem from Adam Walfond he um, writes a lot about pace and I think that um, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is the way that our ability to listen has changed. Um, and I think there's a lot of different reasons for that. There's, you know, one is probably desperation. We are like listening for things because we need them. Um, and maybe, and we don't know what it is. Maybe I feel like that was so present in your story, um, Bonnie this like listening that um, at the edge of something, you don't know what it is necessarily, but you know, you need it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that also, you know, it's been a quieter time. It's been uh, a more outdoor time. It's been a more intentionally connected time. And I think that all of that changes the pace and our, and, allows us to learn to listen better. Well, thank you all um, very much. I, I listen very closely and now I want to read more of, of what you've written. I really, um, I'd, I'd read uh, Maxine's um, poem in the New Yorker. So I was kind of there and I've been following um, Lamb and Chris, but um, you're right, these are interesting times. And I think um, I really appreciate, especially Chris bringing forward the idea of um, poetry and light and that says something now that 
we, we can't say, but then at the same time, I, I listen to Bonnie's story and I think, is that a poem or is that a story? You know, like the way it, it moved and related to Maxine's who also was telling stories in, in her poems. So um, I know we began this with a quote from uh, Bonnie talking about how we need to remove our stories in order to tell the truth, but it, it seems like we're kind of going back to um, the essence of, of telling stories and the experience of them, maybe. I don't know. I don't know how you all feel about that. But again, I don't want to keep you too long because I, I know we're, we're with the other obligations this evening. But um, thank you um, so much. Yeah, I think that that line from Maxine, the, it takes a long time to learn how to live anywhere. I think that's mm -hmm. also happening so much right now is that we're trying in earnest um, to learn how to live here and anywhere, yeah. Well, that's a perfect way to end this now. I think we all are, exactly. And live in our homes and with our people and our pets and our neighbors, as Maxine talked about, and change, but also holding on to what's the same. Wow, a lot, so much to think about. Thank you um, very much. And thank you for, um, uh, gracing the pages of Alaska Quarterly Review. I do have one question though, before we go for Ron. What, and Ron and Maxine, what, what line was taken out? The last line. And what was it? I, I don't remember. Want to... <laughs> <laughs> it had to go. I'll never say what it was. And it was only a question that I asked her <laughs> if she would consider it. Uh, when it disappeared, it was gone. As it, if it, it was really, there, it's but true. I, I, I don't want to it. It, never, it just went out into the air and <laughs> yeah. in the back of Bonnie's story with someone swinging an ax. Um, yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you again for joining us uh, today for AQR's 40th anniversary literary series. And also on the behalf of the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts, um, all our gratitude uh, for the generosity and uh, spirit of today's writers and also to uh, Alex Tate and Cody Carver and the staff at the Anchorage Museum at Rasmussen Center who produced this program. And again, um, if you haven't, uh, please consider making a donation to AQR so that we can continue another 40 years and you can uh, read uh, poets and essayists and writers like the ones that you've heard uh, today. And uh, thank you again. And over the next uh, week or two till we meet again, um, uh, take care of yourselves, and if you're able to, take care of somebody else, too. Thank you. Ron? In two weeks, um, we'll have um, our next event on, on March 14th. We have a trio of exceptional poets and writers, Jesse Lee Kershaw, mm -hmm. Sarah Eliza Johnson, and Victoria Kelly. So that should be wonderful. And I just want to end by thanking uh, Chris Martin and Maxine Skates with whom we've had a very long association. Gratitude to her and to Bonnie Nadz, who um, has done an awful lot uh, for Alaska Quarterly Review. And uh, so very grateful to all three of you. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Heather Lindy, for being the best. And also for being down in Haines too, to make sure that we have the aura of all of that. Okay, well, so. Good afternoon to everyone who's in Alaska and good night to everyone who uh, 